Good morning. Good morning. Please rise as you are able and join us in singing hymn number 188. Come, come, whoever you are. Wonderful. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Sarasota and Lakewood Ranch. My name is Mary Lou Keller and I'm a member of the worship committee which conducts the Sunday services when our minister is away. Only three more Sundays till our new minister, Reverend Jay Wallen, arrives. How exciting. His first sermon will be August 14th, but he and his wife Jan will most likely be here on January 7th. And we have something special planned for that Sunday as well, so don't miss either Sunday. I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors that we have today in person or via live stream, and invite you to visit the church's homepage where we have a visitor's center. You can find it on a banner named Welcome, welcome Visitors. We also invite you to register on our virtual guest book so we can email you our newsletter, the contact, to help to get you know to help to you to get us to know us better <laughs> you're welcome to attend our virtual events and you can get a zoom link specific to specific events by contacting our office via email there's also a donate button on the home page if you'd like to make a donation online you're all welcome to stay for coffee hour after the service in the courtyard and to enjoy the opening reception for artists Jared Vaughn Davis and Samo Davis a, a couple who are here. Jared is an art director at BNY Mellon and an illustrator fine artist who has exhibited work internationally. He's motivated by the contemporary artistic and philosophical theories of metamodernism and romantic naturalism. Samo is a designer and interdisciplinary artist whose art practice includes sculpture, digital works, and augmented reality. I took a look at it before I came over today and it's really very cool art. The works on display in this exhibition are all experimental digital and mixed media works created by the, the two during the last two years of the ongoing pandemic. The exhibit will be up through September 15th and don't miss it. It's great. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, one of the many talented people in our congregation, Lynn Loki. Lynn is a social worker, visual artist, and poet who teaches mindful awareness, meditation, walking meditation and other aspects of Buddhist teachings. She teaches at New College, the Meadows, and at the UU Church here for the Sarasota Mindfulness Institute. She's an ordained student of Suzuki Roshi and helped found the San Francisco Zen Center, the Minneapolis Zen Center, and the Center for Mindful Living in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's a pleasure to have her here with us today and to welcome her as a new member of the worship committee. Welcome, Lynn. The Reverend Kathleen Rowland said, throughout history, we have moved to the rhythms, rhythms of mystery and wonder, prophecy, wisdom, teaching from ancient and modern sources, and nature herself. Today, as Lynn lights our chalice, we recognize the third of our six sources of our living tradition, wisdom from the world's religions, which inspires us in our ethical and spiritual life. The six sources are listed on the back of your order of service, and when, at the UU General Assembly, we learned that they're, they're modifying the seven principles. They're also working on the six sources. So. At this time, the youth who would like to do an art project with Miss Catherine can exit out the back. If there's any young people here who would like to do an art project instead of staying for the service, you can go outside to the back and to the right. Miss Catherine will be there. 
and I know she's got something fun planned. And now for a musical interlude with Christine Bruno. Oh wait, yes, we did like the chalice. Okay, good. Thank you, Christine. Uh, the centering in silence and the centering in words will be all of one piece. So if you would like to close your eyes and just um, take things off your lap. Maybe you put your hands on your lap like this or on your knees or like this, whatever is comfortable for you. And just uh, taking a nice deep breath maybe with a bit of a longer exhale. Just a few of those, a nice deep breath, longer exhale. Just, whew, here we are, safe and peaceful. Yo-Yo Ma said, the notes are important, but the space and the pauses between the notes are just as important. And that's true. So our thinking's important, but the space and pauses where we feel our body and our breath, and we stop our thinking for a minute, and we move down into our body, is just as important. And now we will sing Spirit of Life.
the reading is from a, a lovely book called The Tender Bar. It's a mem memoir by J.R. Moringer. Here's what he says about the bar that raised him. We went there for everything we wanted. We went there when thirsty, of course, and when hungry, and when dead tired. We went there when happy, to celebrate, and when sad, to sulk. We went there after weddings and funerals, for something to settle our nerves, and always for a shot of courage just before. We went there when we didn't know what we needed, hoping someone might tell us. We went there looking for love, or sex, or trouble, or for someone who had gone missing, because sooner or later, everyone turned up there. Most of all, we went there when we needed to be found. And now the offering will be taken and gratefully re be received this morning. I was uh, uh, born during the First World War, and if anybody remembers after the First World War, one of the places that everyone gathered, um, my parents, everybody, was the local bar. Um, I don't know if people remember that, but to me as a child, it was a wonderful place, full of community, people talked to each other, people moved from table to table, you know, they threw peanut shells on the floor. To me, that was great. Um, uh, so I always, I have these lovely memories of bars. Um, uh, then later in my life, I, I, I studied, uh, I was a Unitarian during high school and through college um, in a little Unitarian church in Geneva, Illinois. And one of the things I liked about that church is no sooner was the sermon almost finished when and discussion broke out. People would start talking from the, um, 
from the pews. It was a traditional ch looking church with pews. And I loved that also. There was conversation, there was discussion. And for a high school student, what could have been better? Um, then I moved on to San Francisco and I studied Buddhism. So I've been a, what I call a secular Buddhist or it's follow of Gautama the Sakin for about 60 years now. And I've always blended it with my love of um, my background. I became a clinical social worker in 76. I got my master's and my first job was a community mental health center out in the, the country in Wisconsin. Anybody from Wisconsin here? Oh yeah. If you're from Wisconsin, I, I learned and you know that the two gathering places in the local towns are what? The bar and the Lutheran church, right? If it's a bigger town, there's a Catholic church and maybe a Methodist, but always in the small towns, there's a Lutheran church and a bar. And, um, and I, so I really, uh, in fact, our substance abuse, the head of our substance abuse department in the mental health center, we used to be a bar owner. Well, who could have been better, right? He, he knew his people. So that's the preamble. And the story is um, Gautama the Buddha and a companion uh, who loved Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman is one of their favorite poets. Now someone out there is going to say, well, wait a minute, Lynn. Walt Whitman wasn't even born, born during that time. Well, it's a story, OK? So Gautama and his companion, lovers of Walt Whitman, curious about what was happening in the United States, decided to take a long walk. Um, and they were following Walt Whitman's path in uh, Long Island, starting with Montauk. Any Long Islanders here? Yeah, Montauk is beautiful, beautiful. I was just there with my son. So starting in Montauk, they were following his path and they carried a slim volume of his poems and they would sit on the beach and watch the waves, sit in the fog, sit in the scrubby little forests that are there and just walk, sometimes talk to people if people talk to them, sometimes just open their book of poems and read poems to each other and sort of look at what was happening as they walked. And they came to a town uh, in Long Island as they walked along, it was hot, they were thirsty and they, the only place they could figure out to um, get a drink of water was the, the bar. Um, and his companion said, I know all about these people. It's a great place to go. So they walked into the bar and the bar and the nurse, the waitress said to the bar and he says, yeah, put him over by the window, put Go Gotama and his companion by the window. And there they were with their volume of Walt Whitman in the bar. And as I sat there, they noticed uh, sitting at the bar, uh, two men, one man, his head was bent over, the other man had his arm around him and they could tell the man was crying and the bartender was listening and he's wiping the beer glasses with a white cloth, this was listening, listening and listening. And there were a group of men in dark clothes around them and uh, someone, tipped his chair over, noticing that Gotama and his friend had noticed that, and he said, yeah, his wife died of COVID. We've lost a lot of people in, in this bar from COVID. It's been hard. And, um, and Gotama and his friend nodded. Uh, they'd heard about it, and they knew it had been hard. And it was and it's still hard. And then, as they looked around, they noticed in the corners of the bar, there were television sets blaring out. One set was blaring out all kinds of uh, kind of angry and hateful uh, things, just uh, things that you just shook your head on. And another was, was another TV set was showing fires, the war in, in, in Ukraine, uh, politicians fighting with each other, uh, protests, shootings. Um, black men in car being, cars being shot, schools, the use of guns all over. And, um, and they're looking around the room, they could see people on scrolling their cell phones, a couple of students over in a corner on their laptops uh, with their heads down. And they noticed the, the distress and the tension in the room. 
um, they were aware of that. And now I'm going to turn to the church. We're going to leave the bar, and here we are in the church, all of us. And I think all of us, if, if you're anything like me, have felt the stress and the distress of what's going on in our country and in the world today. Sometimes it's almost, it's just, it's painful. I was, the other day I was talking to some friends and I said, am I getting depressed? And I said, no, I'm not depressed, I'm sad. There's a great sadness in the land. Um, and so, what, what's happening in, is, caused, is called in Buddhism, the floods. And I think if you think of the image of a flood, you can know what I'm talking about. We're flooded. And I was going to read a couple of things um, about the floods, and then we'll talk some about the Buddhist practices that might be helpful to us during this really stressful, difficult time that may go on for some time. John Gottman and Brené Brown who wrote in Atlas of the Heart, we each have a sort of built-in meter that measures how much negativity and technological inputs, TV, phone, computer noise, accumulates. When the level gets too high for you, the needle starts going haywire and flooding of your brain begins. Just flooding, so the floods. There's only so much our bodies and nervous systems can stand before they flip the survival switch and shut down get anxious, depressed, or get cranky around those near and dear. Anybody noticed any of that? Well, I don't like the way you set the, the dishwasher. You know, what? Why would I get cranky about that? So it's, uh, and then the teachings from Buddhism, from a, a Buddhist teacher that I really love, Ajahn Sushito, uh, he's a, a British, he's kind of the typical Brit. He's really down to earth. And he says, how the feelings of being swept along by events, by the sense of being overwhelmed by and even going under. A tide of worries, duties, pressures. That's the floods. And crossing them is about how to find some firm ground, some skills and practices that can help us do more than even surmount the water. We might find boats, we might find boats with oars, we might be able to row, um, some practices that are helpful to us. And um, the first practice is a practice that, um, that if you ever uh, have seen a Thich Nhat Hanh film or you've heard about Thich Nhat Hanh's Plum Village in France, or if you um, um, have, have heard any teachings about Buddhism, the first practice is a very simple practice. When I teach mindfulness, there are a lot of people who say, well, I can't clear my mind. Well, the goal of, of practice isn't to clear your mind. The goal of practice really is to become aware. What's going on? What's happening with me? going on. So the first practice is a practice of embodiment, to be in the body. Often we try to figure everything out in our head, right? We're thinking people, we go in our head, what's wrong with that, that, that. So the first practice is a practice of embodiment, and um, I'd like you all to try it with me. It's pretty much like the, the silence, and that's to put everything down, to just sit in your seat, and again, take that nice deep breath with a longer exhale, about three of those. Nice long exhale. And then I want you to drop down into the awareness of the body, not think about it. So starting with your feet, don't think about your feet, feel your feet in your shoes, making contact with the floor. You might feel your knees. You might feel your hips making contact with the chair. You might notice some sensations of warmth or cool. 
When you notice your hands in your lap, our hands are very sensitive, you might notice a bit of tingling. You might move up and feel your chest and your stomach moving in and out with your breath, your breath that breathes itself. And you might go up to your head, feel your eyes in the socket, feel your cheeks, your jaw, just sensing your whole body. And then open your eyes. Now the practice of this, and this is called just one breath. You can do it a minute. The practice is, is to do this off and on during the day, to stop, to pause. If you're standing and you want to close your eyes, hold on to a chair, the table, you can do it sitting. The practice is to figure out how, how you can remind yourself and be aware that you need a pause. You need that pause between the notes that Yo-Yo Ma was talking about. So during the day, just this one minute breath. So wherever you are, if you're standing, you stand erect. If you're sitting, you sit erect. And you're not thinking about your body, you're sensing it. You're grounding your body, you're feeling it. Some people do it every time they move from a room to a room, which I seem to do a lot. You know, and you move into the other room and you think, what did I come for? Well, you just do your pause then. Just stand there. <sighs> just a pause. And then go on about with what you're doing. And if you do this during the day, on some regular basis, some people do it before they start eating, when they sit down, they pause. And I think that's the function that prayer before meals used to actually help us with. Ah. Gary Snyder, one of, another favorite poet of mine besides Walt Whitman, in this world of unrushing events, the act of meditation, even just one breath meditation, straightening the back, clearing the mind for a moment, is a refreshing island in the stream. This is deliberate stillness and silence. There is no ideology here. It's not Buddhist or Christian or Muslim, except what our bodies tell us as we feel our bodies, our breath breathing itself. And isn't it wonderful that our breath breathes itself? If our mind were in charge, we'd be in big trouble. Our breath just breathes itself. It's just going. We clear the mind and wake up out of the autopilot of reactiveness and are refreshed. And for me, the floods, um, um, the difficult things that we see and hear and we know are going on, the floods are one thing, but my reactivity to them is another. And so this practice is really helpful to me. It grounds me in my body. It refreshes me. It helps me survive the floods and it helps me go out and do the work that I need to do. So Buddhism pra is not a passive practice. It's an active, refreshing, of the body and with the ability and ending of reactivity so that you can be responsive in your life. If there are any questions about any questions about the one minute practice? Okay. And again, figure out how you could remind yourself. Some people on their phone put a little reminder and maybe once an hour dings and they think, okay, need to take a break. Need to Get down in my body, get in my breath, take a break. Some people do it when they move from room to room. Some people, I, my favorite place to do it is when I get in my car before I, first I start the air conditioning on, of course, but when, right? <laughs> but before I start driving, I do that. And when I return, I do the same thing, pull in, before, I just don't hop out of the car. The car is a wonderful place for silence. It's just, just amazing. It's like a silence chamber. 
and just uh, take some breaths before I get out, unload the groceries or whatever. So, The second practice is a walking practice. And if we had time, I would do walking meditation with you, which I have often led here with Sarasota Mindfulness out in your garden. It's a wonderful place to do walking meditation. We've done it. Uh, we did, have done retreats here, um, whole day retreats where we do meditation. There's a talk and we go out in the garden and do walking meditation. And but I also I live in the meadows and I'm sure all of you live in places uh, or near parks that are beautiful. Um, and I walk every morning. I walk um, with my coach, uh, Lola the Beagle. I walk um, and luckily beagles stop a lot. That's the good thing about beagles. Um, so walking meditation really is the same thing. It's not having your cell phone, though you may have it for emergencies, but turn off the sound thing so no one's calling you. Not ear plugs in your ear, though that's fine, if that's what you like to do, but it's to walk and feel your body when you're walking. So um, when you walk, your focus really is on this part of your body. And so you're really articulating, you're feeling, I'm going to do it slow, you're really feeling the articulation of your legs as you walk, how you ground in the ground how you feel your legs and your knees carrying you. And I always tell people when I teach it, if you walked that slow, people would probably stop their car and find out what was wrong with you if you needed help. So you can walk faster, it's fine. But just to be focused on that part of the body and also to stop occasionally and use your senses. Stop and look at a tree. Look at, there's some beautiful little wildflowers that grow around. Um, there's a little, almost a moss rose wildflower that grows. So stop and look at the pattern of leaves. Listen for the birds or the wind in the palm trees or the oak trees. Watch the moving of the moss. So to stop occasionally, which I said because my beagle likes to stop and sniff things, you just stop and you notice. Uh, the beautiful things around you. That's a great refreshment. Also, um, the one nice thing also is to get out of, I always tell people, get out of the walls of a house. Something about being inside is like being encased in your worries. Has anybody ever noticed that? You get outside and somehow they kind of begin to float away. My reactivity, my you know, if I'm upset about something, it kind of floats away. So that's the second Buddhist practice. And if you think about the wisdom teachers, Buddha and Jesus, they walked. They were walking all of the time. People say, well, yeah, Lynn, they needed to get to places. Well, yeah, they did, but walking also was a part of their practice. They noticed things. They saw things. They felt their bodies. They were grounded. And so walking, and walking, if you can do it, is wonderful, wonderful Buddhist practice. The third practice is um, the practice of the heart. And that's where Walt Whitman comes in. It's the practice of love and compassion. Um, at the beginning of the height of the Civil War, Walt Whitman spent three years visiting wounded and dying soldiers. I don't know if any of you know about that part about Walt Whitman. He, um, uh, the a Buddhist would consider him a bodhisattva, a person who um, just gave of himself to the point where he really almost wrecked his health and was told he had to stop going in. He was getting really ill. Uh, well, Whitman was also a walker, by the way. He walked all of the time, all through the country. But um, he, he said that uh, he brought them small gifts. He brought them a shot of brandy. He brought them rice pudding. He brought them socks. He sat with them when they were dying. He wrote letters for them. He did whatever he could do. And he said he admired their stoicism, how they bore their suffering, and he held vigil until they died. And he considered those three years the greatest privilege and satisfaction and the most profound lessons of his life. 
So during uh, the Civil War, which must have, I mean, uh, it's even hard to imagine the, uh, some of these soldiers were 15 year old boys. You can imagine their families at home, the suffering that was going on. So it's the heart, the other teaching of Buddhism is the heart, is the heart. It's the compassion of the heart. So here's some phrases that you can use and sometimes I just need to sit and I need to put my hand on my heart and I need to say these things and they always, we always say them first for ourselves, and then we can say them for anyone else in our life that we want to say them for. Um, and sometimes we say them for people who are sort of difficult or very difficult. And these sayings are very simple and you can use whichever ones you like. You can say, may I be safe. May I be calm. May I be peaceful. May I feel ease in my life. And they can be yours, what, however you want to say them. And to someone else you can say, may you be peaceful, may you have ease, may you be safe. So the hard factors when I first started with the heart factors, I, uh, and I was a, a Zen Buddhist, which was a fairly, was a little bit like being in the military, frankly. Um, it was, I mean, we sat and we sat and we sat and we sat and we st faced a wall and we sat. Um, at the loving kindness and compassion, I thought, oh, that's, that's too, well, it's not strict enough. Um, but what I learned, um, is that it's this wonderful practice that the more you do it, even though at first you think, well, I'll try it out, it really begins to soften and open up your heart and soften yourself. Um, there are some people who wonder, well, does this help the people you send it to? I often send it to the people in Ukraine. I mean, I can do what I can do for Ukraine, but the Ukrainians really don't need me flying over there. I'm not a nurse, I don't think I'd be helpful. So you do whatever you can do, you give whatever you can give, but just to do this to my, my wishes for them, that they could be safe, that they could be at ease, that they could have peace, um, it, 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 it's what I can do. Um, any questions about that practice? So we talked about the body practices, the one minute meditation, the walking outside, the heart practice. And as I said, sometimes it helps to put your hand on your heart. Just breathe there. <sighs> May I be at ease. So these are practices to help us get through the floods. Um, as we then go about whatever work we're called to do for the environment, for social justice, or peace, um, whatever we're called to do, this gives us whatever we need, this helps us, gives us whatever we need to row our boat in the flood or swim above the flood or maybe even cross over to the other side of the stress in our bodies and minds and hearts.
open, I'll sit. In closing, I would like to read um, the Metta Sutta to you. It's, um, it's a lovely sutta. It's part of the Buddhist canon, uh, Buddhist teachings. And um, so I will begin. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, centered, contented, and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease, whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upward to the skies and downward to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whatever, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding, the pure-hearted one having clarity of vision gives this teaching to us. And I wanted to say one more thing about my talk, which I don't know if I emphasize that. The bar and the church are also ways that we survive the floods. Uh, if we heard from the J.R. Moringer talk about being raised in a bar, um, it's a lovely book. The same, both the bar and the church, the similarity is how we are the beloved community, the Sangha, that we support each other. And it's in this, in this holding of each other in compassion and love and wisdom that supports us through the floods of life. So I want to thank you all for being part of this church with me. I mean, you all support me. So thank you all.